we are on article number 11, the perseverance of saints. And the author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. <clears throat> And so we continue to look at the amazing view of the Father's love for mankind and answer the question, why? Why was it all necessary? Why did Jesus have to die for our sin? We said that God had an elaborate plan that would bring to us a redeemer. Because of the sin in the Garden of Eden, without a redeemer, we would be left in our sin for e an eternity. We would be left in this mess that we have forever. And, and, and we would all die and, and go to hell. <laughs> a, a just sentence would be death. God works through 42 generations, <clears throat> which consisted of people circumstances and time and during that time god gave his people laws the law and the law is sometimes called or often or is also called the mosaic law and it was given to moses on mount sinai most times we think when we think of the law we think of the ten commandments and that is true but it also has ordinances on how to live. It has instructions on how to worship. <clears throat> God gave the law to his people for their own good. When the law was presented to the Israelites in Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verse 13, God told them, to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. We need laws. Every civilized society needs them. If we didn't have laws, you think it's crazy now. If we didn't have laws, it would really be a mess. Every home needs laws. Every organization is grounded on them. And so God intended for the Mosaic law to be a blessing to his people. The psalmist wrote in 119 Psalms, verse 97, he says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Then the next, <clears throat> God used his law to reveal himself to his people. In Exodus, the 20th chapter, when God was speaking the commandments in the midst of his own fireworks show, the people saw thunder, they saw lightning, they heard thunder, they saw the lightning, they heard the trumpet blast, and they saw the mountain sp smoke. That was a display of power. God was revealing himself to them. It was such a terrifying display of power that the people begged Moses to speak to them instead of God. As many times as I've read this verse, I've never stopped to grasp the second part of verse 20, which reads, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you. Now, here's the part that I was talking about. He says, God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. That just blew me away. I don't know about this modern day of, of parenting, but back in the day, we wanted our children to have a certain amount of healthy fear of us. Why? Because it would keep them out of trouble when we weren't in their presence. I don't know about you, 
but it kept me from doing some things that I otherwise might have done. My mother had me convinced that that when she said, I brought you into this world and I could take you out. She had me convinced. I never knew that was biblical. <laughs> so God also gave the law to set them apart as to reveal himself to other folk. It, it's like then as now, God wanted his children to be an example for others so that they would want to be a part of his family. And finally, God gave the law to reveal to uh, uh, excuse me, to reveal humanity's need for a savior. The law was all or nothing. In order to achieve a right standing with God through the law, all of it had to be kept to fall short of any part, no matter how small, was to fail to keep the whole thing. And so we couldn't do it. If we were ever going to have a right standing with God, we needed help. And God was the only one that could help us. In the Old Testament, God provided atonement for sin through a system of animal sacrifices. The animal sacrifices of the Old Testament were used to offer atonement for sin. And it was a foreshadow of the sacrificial blood of Jesus on the cross for sin. I always say that if we were still doing animal sacrifices, we would all be vegetarians because we wouldn't have any animals. And, and so, but the instructions for the sacrifices were given in very specific details. Only an acceptable animal could be sacrificed at an acceptable location and in an acceptable method. You could not make a sacrifice to God just any old way you felt like doing. That was the problem with Cain's sacrifice. The requirements were so specific because of what the sacrificial system foreshadowed. The ultimate sacrifice of Jesus was a once and for all atonement for our sins. When Jesus came on the scene, John the Baptist, in John the first chapter, verse 29, the new King James Version, John says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. With the coming of Jesus as the Messiah, he fulfilled the law. He did everything perfect thus making the previous practice of animal sacrifices obsolete. Even though the law is considered to be good, it cannot give salvation. The law only made us aware of our need for a savior. It, it makes me aware of my shortcomings. It's like driving down the highway at 75 and you're fine. Just driving and, and, and going 75. But then you pass a speed limit sign that says 55. The sign is the law. And it makes me aware of the fact that I'm disobeying the law. But it cannot help me to actually go 55. It, it can't save me if I'm stopped. In fact, it serves as a testament against me. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ. No actions or sacrifices made, my, uh, made by humans can provide salvation. What matters is faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus paid the price and was the one-time substitute for our sins. Now, there is no longer a need to seek atonement or forgiveness 
through another method because there is no other method. Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verses seven through 13, speaks of this new covenant. And we will only read verses seven and then drop down to verse 13, but all of it is worth reading. Verse seven in the good news, good news translation says, if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, there would be, there would have been no need for a second one. And then verse 13 says, by speaking of a new covenant, God has made the first one old and anything that becomes old and worn out will soon disappear. So animal sacrifices provided a picture and a temporary covering for what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Paul, in the third chapter of Romans, is where we left off. And Paul is building a case to show that righteousness is received as a gift from God rather than by works of the law. In verse 21, he says that God has revealed a new way to have a righteous standing with him. And this way is apart from the law. Paul is saying, now there is a new approach to God that does not require lots of rule keeping. The new way, which is the gospel, does not require behaving properly. It requires believing. And then Romans 3 and 24 says, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So we are presented with a free gift that gives us a right standing with God. It's free by his grace and through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, meaning it's free to us. But the act of redemption means that somebody had to pay and that somebody is Christ Jesus. My go-to for gift giving, more times than not, is gift cards. I think they are the best thing since sliced bread. You don't have to think about it. You just buy a gift card and your job is done. The person gets something for free but I had to pay for them to have that privilege. God freely gives us a right standing with him, but it cost him something. In order to have the free gift of salvation, God had to pay for that by giving his one and only son to die for our sin. And then Jesus had to pay by giving his life. As the saying goes, salvation is free, but it ain't cheap. And, and so then Romans, the third chapter, verse 25 says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Now, this is another one of those verses that need to be unpacked. The way we get this free gift is that Jesus died on the cross. He was a sacrifice of atonement. Atonement means at one minute. It, it, it speaks of a process of bringing those who are enemies into a harmony and unity into harmony and unity. It means reconciliation. It's an appeasement or propitiation. Jesus' blood on the cross is the satisfaction for the sins of mankind. Under the Mosaic law, atonement for sin was achieved by death of a sacrificial victim, a sacrificial uh, animal. The shedding of blood was the evidence of the animal's death because life is in the blood. So it's the blood that makes the atonement. 
The blood is the covering of sin. We are guilty and deserves eternity apart from God. We deserve to die. But the blood of Jesus covers our sins. It pays the price. Now we're, we're, we're at one of those drop the mic moments. It answers our question of why did Jesus have to die? The next part of, of verse 25 says, he did this to demonstrate his justice. Remember we said that God is a just God, meaning pure justice. He cannot overlook sin. Where there is sin, there must be a payment in a pure justice. Pure justice cannot say, oh, I'll forgive you. I'll, it, you didn't mean to do it. No, pure justice, where there is pure justice, when there's a sin, there must be a payment. Now, let's read verse 25 again with that in mind. God presented him, meaning he presented Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Jesus' blood is the propitiation for our sin. It's the appeasement. It's the satisfaction. It's the thing that, that God looks at and, and says, I'm satisfied. It, it is what is required by a just God to appease his anger, to reconcile him to mankind. Now, here it is. Imagine Paul holding a mic. Then he says, he did this, meaning allowing Jesus to die on the cross. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sin committed beforehand unpunished. Even though I'm not ready for verse 26, I got to read it now because it goes with this. It says he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Then Paul drops the mic. 